Back here, 615 Sessions podcast on the GetBeast.com Zoom line. It's been a minute since either of these gentlemen have been kind enough to grace us with an appearance. Chad Withrow of the Midday 180 and Austin Stanley of A to Z Sports in the morning. Hello, fellas. Chad, I am how's it jealous going? of your backdrop game, by the way, for both of you. <laughs> Terrific backdrops. Mine's terrible, so I gotta, I've got to up my backdrop game. Well, we also do this for – we do this live stream stuff for a living, so you got to have a, a big backdrop for, for the people there. It's, listen, it, uh, we're, we're nothing if not brand aware around here, yes. which, is, which is fine. But if you would like a custom Midday 180 uh, banner or backdrop, I'm sure I've seen some people <laughs> who have flocked to, your, uh, flocked to your assistance at gas stations, restaurants, or otherwise to provide, uh, to provide the appropriate branding and banners uh, to accompany you guys. Jonathan Hutton usually does that for us. He does a terrific <laughs> job of providing all those things on his own. So we thank Hutton for that. Heady play by Hutton. Uh, not a heady play by the two football teams in the state this weekend. Uh, between the Tennessee Volunteers and the Tennessee Titans, one got their ass summarily handed to them in the first half. The other one made it a much more slow and drawn-out process over the course of a Saturday. Now, mercifully for my viewing experience, Isaiah Wilson happened to get suspended in the midst of that Volunteers game. So I caught the Cliff Notes version and not the full experience of Florida. But we are going to talk first and foremost about the Vols. We'll spend some time on the Vanderbilt coaching search as well, because both of these gentlemen have particular insights into that. And then we will discuss what happened to the local professional football team because I thought that was just absolutely hilarious for the better part of uh, two and a half quarters. But Florida and Tennessee, you two understand the meaning of this uh, as much as our audience does, far greater than myself as somebody who finds it completely and totally inexplicable other, for, other than to experience the reactions on the internet. Chad, I, I did not know what to expect of this game other than for the Vols to lose by double digits was there anything out of this that you took that could be <laughs> that could be uh, viewed as hopeful uh, before we rip the coach and his handling of the quarterback situation yeah I mean I think really just a couple of things in terms of positive takeaways it went about as I expected I honestly thought Florida would beat them way worse than they did I was shocked that it was only 17-7 at half I was actually doing a TV game in Cookville for the state championship and uh, got home late Saturday night and, and went back and watched the game. I was following the score and I'm not seeing play by play, but I'm thinking Tennessee's up seven to three in the second quarter and only down 17, seven at half and did a pretty good job defensively for a lot of that game. They gave up a ton of yards, but 31 points against Florida sounds bad, but it's the least amount of points they've scored all year. So I thought, you know, they did some good things defensively. We talk about effort, and it's almost like a joking thing. That needs to be the baseline of any football team. But Tennessee continues to play with effort. I don't think anyone's cashed it in this year. Uh, every week, uh, you, you keep expecting them to have a big letdown in that department, and they continue to play with good effort. And I know Austin can, can speak on this too, but, I mean, the positive development is the quarterbacks didn't lose the game for them. Yeah. And that's what's been happening with Garantano is they had two guys that got in there while they weren't great I can't think of a single time that Harrison Bailey really threw it in, in harm's way. Uh, he did exactly what was asked of him. He got no favors from his offensive coordinator, who I thought did a terrible job setting him up for success in that game. Uh, he did the best he could with that game plan. He made some throws. JT Shrout came in, looked good, threw the ball well. And there were two plays in particular that really jumped out to me with Harrison Bailey where he took off and ran when there was pressure around him for positive plays. And those were two plays that if Garantano was in the game would have either been a pick six or a sack and a drive killer. So in one start, he's already shown more pocket presence and awareness than the fifth-year quarterback for Tennessee. That's a positive. That's something you can build around moving forward. But Tennessee's got Vandy, we think, this weekend. That has to be a win for Jeremy Pruitt and this program. But, I mean, that's really the only two remotely positive things I can think of. Yeah, pocket presence was a term that I thought of, too, is you saw Bailey slide around a little bit. He moved up in the pocket. He slid to his left, to his right, while keeping his eyes up and downfield. And I'm like, 
this guy's 18 and Jared Garantano has been around for years and it feels like seven years that he's been around and he can't do that stuff. Like I could only imagine how much more comfortable Harrison Bailey would have looked against Florida if he got actual legitimate reps and experience uh, maybe against Arkansas or against Kentucky or against Auburn where they let him throw the football because they, they kind of started to let him throw the football a little bit in that first half. And then, of course, we'll get to it. At the end of the game, I don't understand uh, pulling Harrison Bailey in that situation when Jeremy Pruitt's talked all season long on he's not ready, he needs reps. Well, he's gotten practice reps uh, because JG went through the uh, contact tracing, and now you have an opportunity to get him 10 minutes more of game reps, and you pull the kid. It makes no sense. No sense to me. It was also in a moment where he could have had some success because it was Florida right. slacking off a bit. Sure. You know, it's not a prevent defense, but they're not in the same attack mode they were when the game was in any doubt. So there was some confidence building that could have gone on, much like Harrison Bailey entering mop-up duty in previous weeks where he looked good driving the football. They gave that opportunity to J.T. Shrout. Uh, I don't get it either. I mean, we can get more into coaching decisions, but I don't understand watching those two guys how neither one of them got a shot before that when you watch them play I'm thinking what could have happened against Auburn what could have happened against Arkansas those are two very winnable games for Tennessee if they don't get terrible quarterback play and that's the frustrating part for Vols fans but you're right you go back to your first point Chad is that the quarterback did not create points for the other team directly like that's such a big deal and I thought the defense continued to fight deeper into that game harder because they knew their quarterback would not ruin the game for them like Garantano did so many times and we're going to talk a great deal about the coaching decisions because ultimately that's what this season comes down to is Jeremy Pruitt and Jim Chaney and the associated staff, the coaching decisions that have largely lost this team a fair amount of football games outside of negligence on the part of the quarterback. Because ultimately the Vanderbilt game, maybe it means something for, for an in-state rivalry, although it shouldn't given the state of what Vanderbilt's football program is right now and just what they are having to do to drag themselves across the finish line in this mutated college football season what ultimately salvages any kind of reputation for me at least from an outsider perspective for Jeremy Pruitt is the handling of the quarterback situation moving forward and you bring up the instance where he pulls uh, Harrison Bailey late in that game for J.T. Shrout, and I sit there and find it completely and totally inexplicable. And clearly I'm not alone because the rest of the country and the rest of the SEC and anybody who gives a damn about Tennessee football is saying, what the hell are we doing out here? This is the one opportunity, or it's not the one opportunity, but it's one of the opportunities that now that you have finally gotten over your stubbornness, which I think is a key word for Jeremy Pruitt, mm -hmm. there just seems to be this this stubbornness that he cannot overcome in each of these situations to where it is it is simply harming the football team's overall goal and more importantly the development of the greatest asset that you have right now which at least from my perspective is Harrison Bailey for for you guys against Vanderbilt is it about the winning of the game or is it about how Harrison Bailey looks and how they handle Harrison Bailey, because I think it's more about the latter for me. Well, I think for the future of Jeremy Pruitt, it's got to be about winning the game, first and foremost. Sure. I know he said that in his press conference, that bottom line is winning in this league. He's not ducking that. He understands how important it is to win this game. He and, damn well you know, he, better he said, he took a shot he, at Vandy today in the press conference. Too. <laughs> yeah, and look, he, what he said is 100% accurate, though. I mean, mm -hmm. this game means something to Vandy. I, I think that Vandy would likely opt out of that Georgia game altogether just to rally the troops to get a team together to play Tennessee. Yeah. That's all the players care about, coaches, that school. That's all they care about right now is wrecking Tennessee season even more than it's already been wrecked. And for Jeremy Pruitt, I mean, does this game matter to him outside of the development of Harrison Bailey? Yes, I think it does for the future of, of Jeremy Pruitt. He needs to win this game. I would even say he really needs to win this game pretty convincingly. I, I don't think this needs to be some sort of field goal game, one score game late. This needs to be a game where Tennessee continues to play as hard as they have the last couple of weeks. And they go out against a team that's a lot worse than Auburn and, and, and Florida. 
and put it on someone. And that needs to be the goal for Tennessee this week. I know they're talking about, hey, Van, we're going to get Vandy's best shot and this and that. I don't know how good Vandy's best shot really is at this point. So if you're Tennessee, you need to go in and execute and play hard and play well and win a game easily. Does that save Jeremy Pruitt in the long run? No. Does a loss to Vandy kill Jeremy Pruitt in the long run? And do they lose more recruits leading up to, what, three or four days after that, the early signing period beginning after that Vandy game, if they lose to the Commodores? I think absolutely that that's something that could happen. Yeah, I think they need to win. I think they need to cover the spread, which I think opened at 14. I, you got to have some style points, points behind it. And, and, Chad, you're right. If they lose, I don't understand how – Phil Fulmer and Tennessee brings him back. Like they can't. Like if Tennessee loses and they're two and seven, and if they play A and M, they're two and eight because they're not beating A and M. Uh, and an eight-game losing streak going into an off season where the fans are already trending on apathy, you got to do something to move on from Jeremy Pruitt. But he absolutely has to win this game, and he has to look good doing it. I think. What the hell do I got to do to get twenty points? Two times this year. They've scored uh, I, 20 points in a football game. What well, on earth do I have to do to get Jim Chaney to score 20 points for 20 more, or more than 20 points in a football game? Help me understand. So it's happened three times. Jim Chaney. <laughs> it's, happened, it's happened three times, and they've got two defensive touchdowns in those games that have gotten them over 20. So it, it's even worse than it actually looks when you're just reading through the schedule results. All right. Well, and you said, you said it, Buck, you know, stubborn being the operative word. I think you got a problem with that. Look, Jeremy Pruitt has had no problem getting rid of coaches. That he, He'll admit a mistake. He admitted a mistake with Tyson Helton after one year. Had no problem doing that. Um, I do think there's going to be if, – if Jeremy Pruitt's allowed to stick around, I think there's going to be an offensive coordinator change after this year. There's certainly going to be a quarterback coach change. But what I don't get with, with Jim Chaney is he's shown the ability to adjust and adapt in his career. He did it at Pitt. He did it at Arkansas. He did it with Jake Fromm at Georgia. There has been this stubborn play calling with him this year and stubborn game planning that I do not understand. Uh, it's like he's trying to prove a point, but yet he's doing the opposite of that. Every single week with that offense, he continues to trot out. There's no creativity. There's not one game outside of maybe that first drive against Auburn where I look up and think, boy, that was a well-executed game plan to start that game on offense. And, and that, to me, is baffling because I think Jim Chaney's a good coach, and he's had a great career, and he's done some really good things. But for whatever reason, he's not been able to do anything this season. I think that Jeremy Pruitt, if he's going to stay, he's going to have to admit, hey, it's time to get with the times and do something different and change it up with a new offensive coordinator and play caller. And you mentioned all the other places that Chaney's had success. He's done well at Tennessee before doing multiple things. Jonathan Crompton threw 27 touchdown passes with a Jim Chaney coordinated offense his senior year. And then Tyler Bray put together a couple of big years too under Chaney. Uh, and so at this point it's, it's Helton didn't work. Okay. That was Helton. So they moved on from him. Now Jim Chaney's not working. At what point is the bad offensive coordinator now Jeremy Pruitt's fault? Because, you know, you can't just keep cycling through offensive coordinators and blaming all those guys it, it, to me, it seems like it starts with Pruitt because you're right. Cheney has been successful in a handful of other big programs, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me this year. Uh, my, my larger thing with Pruitt, just from a thousand foot view, is I just I don't think that he has the ability or whatever, whatever the it factor. I know that stinks his analysis, but like whatever it takes to galvanize a football team to be able to supersede their ability or their expectations. And I understand that the way that they finished last season was hugely impressive. And in fact, Chad is largely, or at least Chad's producer, David Reed, is largely responsible for me losing my hair at the hands of Tennessee and Jeremy Pruitt and a much improved football team at the end of the season, defeating my mighty Indiana football Hoosiers, uh, now known at fo football institution, clearly <laughs> based off this year. But I, I don't get... And it's not, it's not just watching a press conference. It's, it's observing the behavior on the sideline. It's the inability to either evaluate talent or handle talent. And the fact that the defense, his side of the ball, what is supposed to be his specialty, and particularly the defensive backs, they don't get better. I'm trying to find the one spot where Tennessee, at the beginning or at the end of this season, as we near the end of this season for them, 
where they are discernibly better as a football team to my eye. And the only thing that I can see is that the quarterback play isn't costing them games or at least hamstringing them where they're having to hide the quarterback. And it's only because they've waited this long to make a change. If, if I'm wrong, somebody tell me. Well, you know, I think that – I think these players like Jeremy Pruitt. Now, let me say that first and foremost. I don't think it's an inability to galvanize a locker room or anything like that. I think Jeremy Pruitt is 100% who he is at all times, right? He's an old high school football coach. And, and there are p- football players who they're attracted to that because he is very genuine with them, unlike the previous coach at Tennessee. He's not lying to anyone. Um, they feel like he's got their back at times. Now, is he some raw, raw, charismatic guy? No, absolutely not. He's never going to rally the fan base with his press conferences or anything like that. But I, I, I want to put that out there now. I do mm-hmm. think this team likes him for the most part. So I don't think that's an issue. Player development was not an issue at all a year ago, right? They got guys that got better as a year went on. Nigel Warrior was a different player by the end of the year. Look at the guys who were so much better under Jeremy Pruitt. Daniel Batuli is another one that clearly was developed by Pruitt and his staff. The only thing, and Buck, you're right, because this year has been so bad from a player development standpoint, from the players that they're playing, led by Jarrett Garantano and not going to other ones, all the young guys that probably should get a look that have not gotten a look this year, Jeremy Pruitt better pray that you can just chalk this up to a weird circumstance, COVID-19, no fall camp. I know they've hammered this home. It's an excuse that they like to throw out there. I'm not necessarily buying it. But Tennessee probably was hit as hard or harder than anyone in camp leading up to the season. They haven't been hit hard by COVID-19 in the season. No real problems. That's because they had all of it happen leading up to the season. Now they start 2-0. and So you can say, well, what was the problem then? They started out fine and they lost six straight. Does all that lead to an accumulation that leads to this disastrous season? I don't think so. But that's what Jeremy Pruitt has to sell to Philip Fulmer and everyone else right now is just say, look, we did a terrible job handling the circumstances. We're going to do a better job in a normal season. If it's normal a year from now, we'll do a better job next year with everything. And this is just a mulligan season. I I don't think that's the case when you look around college football, but that's what he's got to sell. And that's what he's got to hope for. I I just kind of thought of a selling point that Pruitt can make. And I don't think he's going to do this because it would include involve throwing Jared Garantano under the bus completely, but you could blame this season all on him because <laughs> you know, and, and, and the first 10 quarters of this season, you were two and zero, and you're up uh, at Georgia. And then what happened? Like th- what? Three turnovers in the third quarter at Georgia. Oh my God. First drive in the what, second half, he fumbles. And, it's, and, it's and then what happened yeah. the next game? How many pick sixes in the first half at Kentucky or ver- home versus Kentucky? And then after that, it's over, right? Because then it's Alabama, and then he does it again. The Arkansas game, uh, he got hurt actually in that game, but it was over there. And so the whole roster looked like they just crumbled once the quarterback started killing the game for them. And now it's festered to the point where only now, only on December 4th, the true freshman quarterback got a chance, a legitimate chance, uh, because – Garantano was in contact tracing. Like, if Jared Garantano was not in contact tracing, I truly feel like he was going to start verse four. Well, and then to Chad's point about winning or galvanizing the the fan base with a press conference, he had a uh, – I wouldn't call him – I wouldn't call it an outburst or I wouldn't call it uh, uh, him popping off in a press conference. But for as much uh, – for as much – emotion or attitude as Jeremy Pruitt has shown at a press conference this year he's at the point now where he is down or uh, dismissing the the Knoxville press corps who's asking him questions I believe Blake Topmeyer of the Knoxville News Sentinel got the most amount of heat I think Jimmy Himes got a little bit off the top as well where he Pruitt is essentially saying and this audio will be included for the audience listening at home but he's essentially saying You know, I don't know how much you know about football, but here's what I know about football, and here's what happened on the field. And when you get to that point, at least when you're dismissing or belittling reporters, and it's not just because we're we're in the media, the three of us, that I feel this way, but it just it screams to me, it reeks to me of weakness when you get to that point. And ultimately, 
I don't know how much of this, how much of the conversation around Jeremy Pruitt is just us spinning our wheels because I don't know how many coaches in the history of college football get into this position where they're backed into a corner and they pull themselves out. But that's just kind of how I feel about this. Like we're largely just biding our time until the next guy comes along with Tennessee football. Well, and so the, the response to Blake Topmeyer, and here would be my question for, for Jeremy Pruitt. Football is very simple to Jeremy Pruitt. He, for a guy who runs such a complicated defense that's hard for players to adjust to, he's a very simple-minded guy in terms of how football is played and executed. And that can be a good thing, especially for college players. When you make things simple and easy on them, it makes things simple and easy on them, which is a good thing for college football players. But Jeremy Pruitt, he's beating his head up against the wall because it's so simple for him to say, well, you know, our, our, our quarterback threw two pick sixes. What, what do you think we're going to do when that, when that happens? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the way he's watching the game. Yeah. It's very easy. Well, you know, we, we got a guy dropping a fake punt that's perfectly executed, and he, and he drops it to keep it dry. I mean, it really is that simple at times, right? Guys just screw up. But the question then would be, how is your team not executing at all compared to other teams? How is this a weekly reoccurrence where you're talking about the great preparation of this team, your coach is doing their best to get everyone ready, and then you go out there and you play hard. No one's going to dispute the coach on that. The team plays hard. You go out there and play hard and still can't execute, or you still make these crucial mistakes that you saw from Jarrett Garantino. Why is that? Is that just simply starting the wrong quarterback? Is that an inherent fundamental problem with your program and your practice approach? These are all questions that Jeremy Pruitt can't be too stubborn to ask himself at the end of the season. Look in the mirror and find out. We feel like we're doing the things the right way. We feel like we're trying to do them like we did at Alabama. But for whatever reason, these players at Tennessee aren't executing at the level we want. They executed at the end of 2019. How do you get back to that? And I don't know if Jeremy Pruitt's equipped to do that, but he's going to have to do that if he's going to have a job even three or four weeks into the 2021 season. Because, guys, and Austin, you know this, this thing is going to get ugly. It's going to be ugly in the offseason no matter what. It's going to get really ugly very quickly if they're not blowing out bad opponents at the start of 2021. Yeah, this feels a lot like – the off season after 2016 going into 2017 yep. where that was going into Butch's last year. And I'm on record saying that after Tennessee loses to Vandy to get them out of the sugar bowl, that's the time to move on from Butch Jones, not let it uh, go on one more year, but for, for that off season. So basically the calendar year of the beginning of 2017, the off season was quiet. Like, you know, we run a digital media business. We see all these analytical numbers it was quiet. Fan interest was down because they knew what was about to happen, right? They knew it was about to be really ugly. And then when it did happen, then they all got fired up and blew up at it. So that, that's the feeling that I have about it. Now, going back to the, the Pruitt answer to, to Blake Topmeyer and Jimmy Hyams, it's, those are absolutely fair questions to ask a head coach especially when those two guys are good media members. They're not trying to spin words. They're just giving a head coach an opportunity to put an answer on the record so they can communicate why was Jared Garantano not ready. Oh, because he hadn't practiced in 13 days. Okay, sounds good. That's, that's it. That's all they need to have on record. Why are they, the DBs getting beat inside? Oh, because uh, they're, you know, they could play outside shade or inside shade. Just get it on the record. And move on. It's not that big of a deal. Media members, most of the time, are not trying to catch you uh, speaking out of both sides of your mouth, which Pruitt happens to do quite often, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm actively rooting for chaos and for another coaching search because nothing in my life was like the Butch Jones and then everything after Butch Jones. Like I, that, that, that was, the, that was the, the month that I fell in love with Vault Twitter. Nothing has ever, been that, this is, nothing has ever been that good the, for me before. What you're rooting for is what everyone not affiliated with university, like Austin and I are graduates <laughs> of the university. Everyone that's not a fan or not affiliated is rooting for chaos for Tennessee and Vols. They want failure. They want dark days. They want a complete demise because they know the passion of this fan base. And I always warn Tennessee fans against this. It's easy to feed into that because people like Buck Rising are going to stir stuff up on Twitter <laughs> Uh, Dan Wolken's going to do it. Every single college football writer is going to do it because at some point, Vol fans have eviscerated them because of something they wrote or something they said. 
So that's going to start happening. It's easy to fall into that. Hey, Hugh Freeze. And hey, it's easy to go there. Look, and I'm no different. I mean, it's, it's very easy to say, let's throw it all away. It's all going to hell anyways. Let's get another coaching search going because Tennessee fans just want hope more than anything else. And what does a new coach offer? Hope. So we're in this perpetual cycle of let's reset, let's hit the panic button, let's try to get hope somewhere else because hope is running out right now. And I get it. I'm not going to argue Jeremy Pruitt's done a good job. I'm not going to argue necessarily that he definitely deserves a fourth year. I think he's going to get one. I can understand how Philip Fulmer could sell giving this guy a fourth year given the weird circumstance of this season. But it's going to take some winning back over of the Tennessee fan base with Jeremy Pruitt. But I would just caution Vols fans to not fall into this Buck rising trap of going into the chaos that Buck wants desperately. Come on home. Austin, before you respond, I will, not, I will say, Chad, that there's a difference between me and Dan Walken. Dan Walken is out here provoking Vols fans and provoking people. I, the only provocation that I do is I tweet the, uh, the picture after every time they lose of the two, uh, we'll say, slightly overweight Vols well, fans. Well-fed. Well-fed <laughs> uh, Vols fans looking quite distressed. It is the only thing that gives me uh, that gives me joy when they lose. And the Butch Jones thing, it was I needed a cigarette after that. I was post-coital <laughs> for, uh, for weeks, I will be completely honest. But there's a difference between me and Dan Walken. Go ahead, Austin. Yeah, well, it's just that, well, because it's so entertaining. Because oh. Tennessee does amazing things to make it entertaining. It's like, all right, fire up the plane searches. Like, everybody knows what the tag is on the Haslam jet. Like, so it's it's just too good, right? It's It's an amazing – well, I guess the last time it was an amazing month and a half of what it felt like of what was going to happen with the Tennessee coaching search. But, you know, I, I agree with everything Chad said. You want hope, but you also want somebody who's competent and it can show you tangible progress. What I don't want either is, is keeping a coach who's not showing you any progress, but, you know, it's year three, it's too early. You got to give him a fourth year. Well, for what? A fourth year for what? Because I've, I've had, and Chad, I'm sure you've heard the same from Tennessee fans, uh, Tennessee can't keep firing a coach every three years. Well, they've only done that once, and it was Derek Dooley. So I, I always respond to those people and say, you think Derek Dooley deserved year four? And they kind of catch themselves because if you know the coach isn't the guy, cut the fat. Get rid of it. Get out of it when you know it. And don't let it hang around, and it's just only going to make the situation worse for the next guy. And that's what happened. You know, I, I, Pruitt had to clean up a bunch of stuff, too. Yeah. Fair. And no, in, in Austin, you, you've raised good points. I'll say this, too. So, Philip Fulmer hired Jeremy Pruitt. It's going to be Philip Fulmer's decision. I believe it's going to be Philip Fulmer's decision solely. So, then the question, the big question I have for Philip Fulmer is he knows football coaching as well as any AD that's going to hire and fire someone or oversee a program. So if Philip Fulmer honestly recognizes that it's not working after year three, like Austin says, will he be willing to cut ties with the guy he hired and admit that problem and move forward? Or will he be stubborn? Going back to that same word, stubborn. Be stubborn and say, I'm not firing my guy after three years, even if deep down I know that he's not the guy. Now, he said all the right things so far. I, I think that a loss to Vanderbilt, this may be like the, the catch-22 for Vandy fans. You may beat Tennessee this year and then get a new good coach in for <laughs> yeah. Tennessee at the same time because I, I do think that if you go in and look bad and don't play hard against Vandy and, and just look incompetent again and lose to this Vandy team, I'm keeping every option on the table uh, for Phillip Former. I think that's the one thing that could reset things a bit. But um, that's, that's my big question for Phillip Former. Will he be stubborn? Because we know that he knows. I feel like he knows one way or the other. Maybe he's telling the truth and he really thinks that Jeremy Pruitt is just a couple breaks away from turning this thing around. Maybe he believes that. But if he doesn't, I hope that he'll acknowledge it and do what needs to be done. We'll transition to Vandy here in a second. But that's like that's the thing that that gets me caught up with Philip Fulmer. Like, I, you guys would have the answer to this better than I would, whether, whether he would make that decision, because ultimately that's admitting fault on the part of Philip Fulmer, because Chad said, that's, that's his guy. That's, and again, the circumstances were not ideal for him to be thrown in uh, to that job for a rogue AD uh, in the midst of a coaching, hiring, non-hiring, national disaster that went on throughout the course of the uh, Shiano Gate 
and on and on the story goes. Uh, but like, I just, when I think of Philip Fulmer, the first thing that comes to my mind is at this, I don't know if it was a, a booster luncheon or whatever the function was before the season, when he is up there with the microphone and he's feeling it and he's leaning in and he says, the Vols are back and we're going to get a piece of everybody's ass. And it just, I just sat back watching that or seeing that clip on the internet and be like, buddy, like I, I haven't been around that long and I know how this show goes. You, you got to have more self-awareness in that. And that's the only thing that catches me up on Philip. Yeah, and that was, uh, I believe that was after the Indiana Bowl game. So they had just won six in a row, eight and five, year two. You feel like the progress is being made. You're kind of ahead of schedule at that point after starting 0 and 2. Recruiting's going great. And he's at this Vol booster luncheon where he kind of forgets that there are cameras there and he just goes off the cuff. I mean, it, it was a funny moment, but at the, at the time, it felt like he wasn't lying. Like it, it felt like he was. He wasn't wrong. They were showing progress, and it's been all of it. All of that good equity is, has been ruined in the last couple of months. All of it. See, and I, I, I love it. Like, I, I have the opposite reaction. Like, at least someone around there acts like Tennessee is worth the damn. Sure. And if someone's going to act like they're worth the damn, I'd like for it to be the person that's in charge of the athletic department. So if he's excited at that moment, I mean, look, in hindsight, we can say a lot of things are foolish that we've said and done when you've got, you know, eight games of evidence the other way after the fact, a year later after a global pandemic, that it's easy to take shots at Philip Fulmer and say that he's an idiot for saying that. But at 2-0 and and 14th in the country and mauling people up front and one of the top recruiting class in the country, I, I for one, didn't see a six-game losing streak on the horizon. I mean, I guess I probably should expect that at some point with this Tennessee program as long as I followed it in the last decade. But, I mean, there, there was evidence to lend Philip Former to believe that was the case. Certainly not the case. So he does look foolish in hindsight. But at least someone's got some pride about where Tennessee should be because I, I just don't – the more this happens, the more the fan base gets beaten down, the more the players get beaten down, the coaches, the more acceptance you get of where you are. It, not, not just nationally, but in the SEC, in your own state at times. And I think that can be a real loser mentality moment to set in. So, it, look, at least Philip Former doesn't have that loser mentality yet. Maybe a couple more years on the job and he'll be like the rest of us. Just down, have Rod. Loser mentality. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Well, and, it's, it is. and I think that, that, like, that's largely the disconnect. Because you're right, Chad. It is, it's easy for me to be snide and sarcastic and dismissive in retrospect. And I, I try to catch myself from doing that. But, like, that's what I know of them. Whereas you guys, you know historically great historically relevant Tennessee football, not just in the SEC, but in the, on the national landscape where you are competing for national championships and you are a school in the, in the, in the worldview of college football that is worth a damn, that people give a damn about. And we know, we, all of us here know, not, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to be here long to figure out how much people give a damn about this football team, everything that all of my inter or interactions would indicate that as well. It's just a different worldview of where they have been for people who know what they have been and what they can be versus people like me who in the last decade or in the last five years have a different Tennessee experience entirely and look back on that and be like, man, I, you know, this is the same story over and over and over again. But I digress. Speaking of same stories over and over and over again and hope and competency, Vanderbilt, uh, what, the, what the hell do you do? I mean, honestly, like you guys have been keeping tabs on this. It is, of course, locally relevant uh, for us as people who want Vanderbilt to be good in the SEC, who want there to be competitive college football here in Nashville, in the city that we all live and work in. Where does it start, and what should the expectation be given where whomever takes that job next is going to work? I'm on record that you got to be different at Vandy. You don't need to run from your difference from the rest of the conference. You need to embrace it. You're the small, private school, academically-minded institution in a world-class city. That's very different than the rest of the SEC. Embrace that and do something totally different than the rest of the conference. 
I've, I've been saying it for years, bring in the triple option. It's what I would do. I'd hire an academy coach. I'd go Jeff Munkin or Ken Niamatololo, one and two on my list. If those guys were to say no, then I'm getting to – I know Austin loves Will Healy. I love Will Healy. I think he's going to make a great coach for someone. Why not Vanderbilt? I think that'd be a good choice for them because he would, he would bring that marketing savvy that you saw with James Franklin uh, to West End. I think Clark Lee – is someone who interests me with the Vandy ties and has done such a good uh, job at Notre Dame. But I think more than anything at Vandy, you need someone who's going to be different. You know, there's the, the uh, reports out now about Scott Cochran, the strength coach, pushing to get the job, which I hear that. I think that sounds insane. But they just hired a G League coach in Jerry Stackhouse yeah. to coach the, the men's team. So maybe that's outside the box enough for Vanderbilt to consider – I don't know. I just think offensively you got to do something really different there. That's why I like the triple option idea. But if they don't go that route, the two guys that make the most sense, Clark Lee, Will Healy. Yeah, well, I think Scott Cochran would uh, – they would, at least wouldn't have a doughy roster. And I know, Chad, that's a word that me and uh, you no. kind of got in trouble with a few years back on Twitter. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No more. All- no more Pillsbury Doughboys on the <laughs> roster. If Scott Cochran's there, molding young men. Right. So look, that sounded bad the way I said that. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, you never. Listen, know. Rex Road uh, comes uh, on this podcast and makes dick jokes all the time. It's okay. Do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your triple option uh, coaches are not a, a bad thought, Chad. But I also think Vandy needs a coach who has a clear vision for what Vanderbilt can be, not what Vanderbilt has been. Uh, and I think this coach, I'm so fascinated by this search because I think the timing of it, where you have a guy like Will Healy and a, and a guy like Clark Lee who have a different type of feel and care for Vandy football that are up and coming coaching names, where that, that hasn't happened when they hired James Franklin or Derek Mason. You know, those were guys from outside of this region that had no tie uh, to the university that. I mean, Derek Mason was looking at Colorado multiple years to try to move on from Vandy. Penn State came open, and James Franklin, you know, obviously you don't say no to that job. But I think Will Healy and Clark Lee have a good vision of what Vanderbilt football can be and using Nashville to its advantage. And I know this. I've been poking around the Will Healy thing for a while, and Will Healy has been positioning himself for this job since the spring of 2018. Like, I, I know that he has been working angles on this. He is as prepared as, as he could possibly be for what he thinks he could do at Vandy. And I'm sure Clark Lee's the same way uh, because he played there. But I, I'm very fascinated to see what they do. And for Will Healy, this is your one chance to get him. If you pass on Will Healy, he's not going to be available for Vanderbilt the next coaching cycle for you, for Vandy. And so this is it. And if you get him, Maybe you get something special if you get him and it doesn't really work out. Well, it's Vandy, right? But I think this is your one chance to get Will Healy, and I think you got to take advantage of that. I w- would you guys rather, if not, and obviously not all things being equal, because uh, one job is open right now, and the one that I'm getting ready to bring up in comparison is not. But would you rather be the head coach of North Carolina football or Vanderbilt? Wow, that's a that's a good question. How about, How about this? Vanderbilt? Well, yeah, I was, and I actually think there's a chance that David Cutcliffe could retire uh, at Duke at the end of this season. Which job would you rather take, Duke or Vanderbilt? Because a guy like Will Healy, a guy like Jamie Chadwell at Coastal Carolina, if Duke comes available and Vandy's available at the same time, those are pretty similar jobs there uh, to kind of go along with your North Carolina take there too. Well, and what – so, to me, it all comes down to what do you want as a coach? Do you want a chance to win and win a lot of games each year or a chance to live in a great city, make a lot of money, and be safe at six and six every single year or or five and seven? I I get sort of fed up with this whole mentality. I hear this from so many friends of mine that I trust, that I I admire, that work in this business, that when they bring up a name for Vandy – they say, well, this person wants Vandy because, I mean, it's Vandy and they've never won. And if they just went a little bit, it's great job security. And you get to live in Nashville and not be bothered at restaurants. You see all these celebrity coaches' names that pop up. And I'm thinking, if I'm Vandy, I don't know that I want to hire someone that yeah. wants my job because, you know, they can go to Jay Christopher's and not be recognized 
uh, out in public or wherever it is they want to go. And then it's going to be good job security because there's no pressure on winning. You want someone like a Will Healy, honestly, or a Clark Lee that takes that job and they see that as their salvation. They see that as their that, – that's their ability to eat is to go coach at Vandy and make a head coaching career for themselves. I'd rather have a coach like that than someone that just says, oh, it's Vandy. You know, if I don't win, I'm just like every other coach there. If I do win, I'm there forever. It's a lifetime contract. I get to make a lot of money. Um, so to compare Duke and Vandy, you can win more at Duke. I mean, David Cutcliffe has been to the ACC championship game. Vandy's not going to the SEC championship game anytime soon. They've never been. I don't know if they'll ever go, quite frankly, maybe with the right coach. But you can do that at Duke. So you can win more at Duke. I think history shows that. But I'd still rather have the Vandy job because Nashville's a better city. You're in the SEC. And with the right coach that can drive that administration along and get facilities built for Vanderbilt, I think the, the, the sky is the limit at Vandy for what they could do. Now, could they be 7-5 and five regularly? Yes. And that's great success at Vandy also. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'd take the Vandy job. I mean, Duke's great, but you're still in the ACC. You're still playing in an inferior conference. Um, and Clemson is running that whole show over there. So Duke, uh, yes, you can win there. You can regularly win eight, nine games uh, in a good stretch like Cutcliffe did. But I, I think Vanderbilt, if you schedule correctly in the non-conference, which James Franklin did, and then you go out there and you beat uh, two of the four – lower SEC East teams in Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, South Carolina, just beat two of them every year and you're six and six. That's all it takes. Um, and I think Will Healy and Clark Lee and some of those other type of coaching names, they understand that. And they also, I think, know how to recruit locally or Nashville booming in recruiting grounds as well. And you've got Healy who's got the, the all the private school connections as well you can get good players to come play in the sec i think you can really make an impact and a footprint on the community at vanderbilt where at duke you're always going to be the football coach behind the basketball program same thing with north carolina you're always second fiddle well college baseball's great at vandy and everything but you have a chance to really be the guy on campus at vandy because basketball's not it right now either uh, so I'd take the Vandy job for sure. I think there's a big opportunity here. Well, the only reason I brought up North Carolina at all is because I know Will Healy and Mac Brown are close and that yeah. he's close to retirement. And so there could be some consideration of Will Healy to that job and waiting it out rather than take a swing on a place like Vanderbilt. But, you know, both, both, both represent, I think, viable options for a guy who's young, who's up and coming, who has energy and who clearly wants to make an impact. Well, here's another one, Buck, for you. Not in North Carolina, but another job to make him open a year from now, make him open this year. What happens to Will Healy, Jamie Chadwell? I'll throw those two examples out. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of those guys is not going to get the Vandy job. Mm -hmm. Are one of those guys the Tennessee coach a year from now? <laughs> no, because I mean, that's, it's going to be Hugh Freeze. <laughs> and, that's, and that's something that – I mean, that, that's something that those guys – I mean, know in the back of their mind. Sure. I mean, they, they know what's going on. These coaches are all – they gossip. They know what's going on. They see Tennessee struggling right now, and they're thinking maybe that job comes open. Jamie Chadwell grew up a huge Vols fan. Yeah. I know that for a fact. He's from Anderson County High School, 20 minutes north of Knoxville and Clinton. Uh, he would love that job. That is a dream job scenario. It's Hugh Freeze's dream job, too. I mean, I, I truly believe that. Hugh Freeze covets that Tennessee job. Would Will Healy like to have that Tennessee job? You're damn right. Yeah. If Tennessee was open. <laughs> and I think even with his ties to, to Vandy, if Tennessee and Vandy were open at the same time, and he could go either place. He'd go to Tennessee. So that's, that's something to keep in mind is, will Vandy get it right, which they have a chance to get it right now, but then whoever they don't hire, is that someone in the mix at Tennessee a year from now? That's, to me, that's very intriguing with what could take place in the state. Oh, sure. Just vultures out here circling the next best job. I, right. I, love, I love the coaching profession from that angle. Uh, we, we have not yet talked in the waning minutes here about the local professional football team. Nobody is getting fired there, but the defensive performance was a fireable offense. Uh, Baker Mayfield, who I feel to be thoroughly pedestrian and whom I called a fraud and then immediately made me eat it because uh, ten uh, the Tennessee Titans defense appears to be more fraudulent even than we expected in what they did on Sunday, yesterday, as we taped this podcast at Nissan Stadium. Four first-half 
passing touchdowns for Baker Mayfield, 38 points given up in the first half, uh, which, you know, the, five, the box score looks a lot better, as we all know, 41 to 35 at the end of that game. Second half comebacks are lovely. Three points in the second half, fine. But all of those things, just a complete and total ass kicking from two teams who are supposed to be maybe on equal footing, maybe on the same tier level as we evaluate the AFC. But the Titans are supposed to be what the Browns have yet to achieve. The Browns are supposed to be a team that's finding their foothold as they navigate their first legitimate postseason push in the better part of the decade, uh, certainly in the last 20 years of their relevance. And they just absolutely stepped on the Tennessee Titans, who I think, the three of us, perhaps I'm mistaken in that regard. I don't want to speak for anybody here, but I think that all three of us probably think the Tennessee Titans to be a superior team at this point. That was not, in fact, the case on Sunday. Uh, do, can, are, can they survive this way when they're, they've lost three of the four games against the AFC North because they don't score first quarter points? And that absolutely damns them for the rest of the game. And none of those three games are aligned in the outcomes and how they came to not score any points in the first quarter. But if the offense can't get them there, doesn't seem like they can do it. And I don't think that I don't think that's going to get them very far come January. Well, and when you look at Cleveland coming into this game, when they were bad, they were really bad. Really bad. You think about that Baltimore game and in their losses, they just look pathetic at times. And now I look at the Titans and I think, boy, that Cleveland ass kicking, what happened, whatever the hell happened in Cincinnati, which I'm still not quite sure. Oh, uh, I tell what you, went Jonathan on on Joseph, that Sunday. Jonathan Joseph happened. Jonathan Joseph. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I'm that's sorry. the guy that got fired. He, he got and, fired. Yes. He, <laughs> Fireable he, got, offense. he yes. got fired for sure. But <laughs> you, you see what happens there. You think, okay, well, the Titans are the same way. I mean, it's, you can take all those teams and jumble them up and, and fans are always going to complain about the inconsistency of the Titans, but I'm thinking if you're not great, you're inconsistent. Here's what you are in the NFL. You're either great, so you are Kansas City and you're Pittsburgh, and you win every week because you're great, or you're pretty good or a good team, and you're wildly inconsistent that leads to a winning record, or you're terrible, like the Jets and all the teams at the bottom, of, and, and even the Jags who have been competitive, even though they continue to lose. So I think that's sort of where the Titans are right now. Now, the performance against the Browns was as bad as I can remember. I, I don't want to have this recency bias with this performance. I actually went up during the first half and I started looking up that 59 to nothing loss to the Patriots because it's the only thing I could think of in my years watching the Titans that was as bad. They were down 45 to nothing at halftime of that game in the snow. I didn't realize they only scored 14 second half points to win 59 to nothing, but the Browns almost got to 45 <laughs> the first half because I'm thinking this has to be close to most first half points ever given up by a Titans team. I mean, guys, I don't know what else there is to analyze or say about that game other than it was miserable. Baker Mayfield, to your point, Buck, I, is he the best faker in the history of the NFL? I've never seen a guy completely fool a team on play fakes the way Baker Mayfield was able to with the Titans. It was a terrible performance. I think Baker, and I, I thought about this going back to Oklahoma, his Oklahoma times, uh, where he beat Tennessee twice, so I watched him pretty closely. He's got a little Brett Favre in him with, with his ball handling in the backfield. So I think he's, he's always been pretty good at that and how quickly he can kind of deceive defenses with, with where the football's going. But this just tells me the Titans are limited. I mean, they, they're – they might win a playoff game and then they're not going to be able to stop the quarterback they face next. And that's what this roster is unless the offense just absolutely gets it clicking and it, the script goes perfectly and the defense forces a tip ball turnover, right? Like that's kind of what has to happen for the Titans to advance to where they got to last season. And I just don't see that really happening that you're going to have to rely on the balance of the football to, to be able to beat either Pittsburgh or Kansas City. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, that's how they've, that's how they've gotten to eight and four is the offense kicks ass and you get a tip ball turnover because Jeff, Jeff Simmons gets his hand on one or uh, a backup, uh, backup left tackle gets inserted against the Colts. So Harold Landry finally starts to get pressure. 
uh, the Jadavion Clowney thing, we haven't talked about this on the podcast. And as I mentioned, as we discussed the balls, Isaiah Wilson got suspended in the middle of the balls game on Saturday, which is a different matter entirely. But like the thing that I come away with this defense, they're not getting better. I don't know what the hell the Adore Jackson thing is. I know I'm trying to work on it. I know Paul's trying to work on it. I know everybody's trying to work on this godforsaken story with the Titans' top corner that's now missed 13 weeks of football. But the Pat, I mean, how much better does the secondary get if you can't get pressure on Baker Mayfield? You knock him down once, you pressure him twice through the four quarters that they played a football game. And I understand that the Cleveland Browns, their identity is predicated off that offensive line. They are a bunch of shit kickers up front. And they summarily handled the Tennessee Titans yesterday in a way that we saw the Cle- or excuse me, the, uh, the Titans do to the Colts against guys not named DeForest Buckner. Whatever the case may be, you, you block the people in front of you, that's fine. But I just don't see any path forward or any course correction outside of you got to get super creative. And to this point, they have not shown me the ability to get super creative with how you manufacture pressure. Because the pressure ain't coming from Tuzar Skipper. It ain't coming from Derek Roberson. And Harold Landry played 67. I Actually, I think it was more than – I think the snap count was – I might have my snap counts mixed up. Anyway, he played more than 60 snaps, and that's not sustainable as we get later and later in the year because they only do this – with three outside linebackers, because that's about all they have left. I don't know what they do. I really don't. It's, it's, I mean, someone joked with me yesterday that they asked, did, uh, did they have to amputate a Dory Jackson's leg? But what exactly happened? Because the more you watch the secondary play and the more that Mike Vrabel won't answer what the setback was or if a setback happened. No setback, no collusion, no setback. It's unbelievable, Buck. That the, I mean, he will not – and it's a, just a game for Vrabel now to not say what it is. But I, I start to get concerned. I mean, he's not on IR, so it can't be that bad, you would think. But what the hell is going on that, that he can't play right now? I know it's not his fault. I'm not one of those people you hear from Titans fans who want to blame Adoree Jackson. But I do start to get concerned about his availability. Not just this season, but moving forward when it's, it's this odd in terms of how they discuss the injury. Yeah, like I get at some point like not talking about the injuries protects the player. But at some point, talking about the injury also protects the player because now yes. people are coming after a Dory Jackson because nobody knows what the hell's happening. Like it happened in the bubble. We weren't allowed in because of COVID. And all of a sudden, here we are and everybody's Christmas shopping. We haven't seen a Dory Jackson in a month and a half. Because he was practicing. He went through a couple weeks where he was out there doing stuff. I saw Buck's, Buck posted the video all over social media. We saw him, and I don't know when the last time anybody set eyes on a Dory Jackson that doesn't work for the Titans. Uh, that Friday before what was, I think, Cincinnati, uh, if I remember correctly. Because he got activated on November 11th. Pre Halloween, right? Pre Halloween. -Halloween. He has not practiced in the entire time that he has been on the active roster as we sit here. But there's no setbacks. There's no collusion. There's nothing (laughs) wrong with the Dory Jackson. Just don't look at that fucking third field or you're going to get your ass (laughs) jacked. Like that's the way that it goes. I've been been motherfucked by. Mike Vrabel, that's the it's the that's best as scared as I've been for you. I've ever got. I've never been scared for you before. I was scared for you that day. Mike Vrabel is a scary individual, uh, just because he's a large, large individual, and large <laughs> individuals, when angry, are quite frightening, and uh, that could be Mike Vrabel at times. It's angry a, and illogical at the same time. The only thing yeah. that would have been beneficial out of that if you had a Nat geo his ass like a charging rhinoceros uh, at you off the third field that we could have gotten for social media. Uh, I had the camera. It, it, I wish it was rolling. It just but, wasn't rolling. Too bad. So, such is life. Missed opportunities yep. on that day, but no missed opportunities here on the 615 Sessions with our friends Austin Stanley of A to Z Sports in the Morning and Chad Withrow of the Midday 180. You can hear these fine gentlemen 8 a.m. weekdays, Monday through Friday on the A to Z Sports Network. You can hear Chad Withrow, of course, on 104.5 The Zone, the Midday 180, 9 to 1 p.m. weekdays. And you can subscribe, rate, and review wherever it is that you get your podcast if you don't catch it live. I cannot recommend highly enough the podcasts that they put out, especially if you're into the guests that they have on. Gentlemen, I appreciate your time and your insight uh, and, uh, and the evaluation of uh, coaching incompetency that seems we'll never leave this thing. 
Thank you, Buck. Thanks.